Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the January 2024 LAPPG meeting. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. I want to give a huge thank you to Laura Persley for helping us put this amazing panel together. So first, I want to introduce our moderator for tonight, and that's Craig German. Uh, Craig has uh, held executive positions in post-production and at Hollywood Film and Television Studios for over 20 years. He was most recently CEO of Crafty Apes, a visual effects company that works in Hollywood's biggest blockbuster movies and premier TV shows. And prior to that, Craig spent three and a half years building and leading the worldwide post-production organization at Amazon Studios. So welcome, Craig. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Wendy, and thanks for that introduction. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I tasked you with a, a not an easy job tonight, but I know you are up for it. I know you are the man for the job. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and we have lots of ground to cover. Anybody who has questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A um, pod, and then we are going to do the questions at the end. So um, feel free to use the chat, though, to talk amongst yourselves, um, ask questions of each other. But if you have questions for our panel, put it in the Q&A pod, please. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you, Craig. Thanks so much. Thanks, Wendy and Woody and Laura for inviting us here today. And also thanks to the panel. Um, these are, it's a great panel of experts. Uh, I can't claim responsibility for uh, finding these great people. It was uh, Laura Persley's uh, uh, fantastic job there. Um, we do have a packed agenda. We had a really uh, meaty set of topics, so we're not gonna cover all of them in depth today, but we are gonna focus on uh, four of them that are really top of mind for us all at the start of 2024. Uh, the first one, obviously, uh, we made it through the strikes. Um, and and it was painful. So we're going to talk about the long tail effect of the strikes on our industry, what happened during the strikes and where do we see it going. We'll also talk about <clears throat> the financial stability and sustainability of our industry. That's been an ongoing concern. We have even more pressure on us after what happened last year, but it's been building for a long time and I think we all know that. Um, thirdly, <clears throat> we'll talk about the AI tools that have been coming out and uh, obviously become uh, very popular topics of conversation whether you're pro or against. And so we'll talk about their impact on visual effects. And then finally, uh, we'd like to talk a bit about career mobility. Uh, we have uh, people who are just entering the industry and they're trying to figure out how do we get in and, and deal with work from home and um, the chaos that's going on. And then we have people who are veterans and uh, they have been trying to figure out like, um, how do you have more stable life in this industry? So we'll talk a little bit about that um, with our panelists. And as uh, Wendy said, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, Wendy did a great intro, but I've been in the entertainment industry for a little over 30 years, uh, which is so hard to believe. And I started on the technology side in a bunch of startups. Um, from there, I moved into um, a company that some of you may remember called Ascent Media Group, which was eventually bought by Deluxe and then Technicolor. Then I went to studio side at Paramount Pictures, NBC Universal, and finally Amazon Studios. And as Wendy said, I was most recently CEO of Crafty Apes. I'm also on the board of the Hollywood Professional Association. We collaborate very closely with LAPPG. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. So uh, first off, I'm going to introduce Marcus LeVere, who is a VFX supervisor and also the creator of OpenBit. Uh, Marcus, <laughs> why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, your background and what you're excited about? Hi. Thanks, Greg. Um, yes, I am a VFX supervisor. I've been doing it 23 years, God forbid. And um, I'm still interested and still loving it. Uh, what probably really excites me is that it's changing so radically right now. We'll probably dive into that with AI, but um, maybe I'll wait until we get to that point. But um, I'm also a slash founder now, got pushed out with the uh, the strike. So I have a, a deep fake scanning rig that I'm working on too. So uh, lots of different things to talk about today. That's fantastic. Thanks, Marcus. Next up, uh, we're going to bring up uh, Alia Lopez, who, as uh, Wendy said, is the Vice President of Film and Television Visual Effects at Skydance, as we, we've seen lots of fantastic films from them. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, background, Alia? I'll make this quick. I don't have quite as many years as Marcus. Um, uh, he looks so young, though. Um, I've been in it probably about 16 to 17 years now, and it's span 
plethora of areas. I started in post-production uh, trailers and films way back in the day when DI was actually first coming around, worked on ACES and the whole initial digital workflow when Alexa came on board, uh, then moved over crazily enough, uh, which I think we'll talk about in just sort of career, you know, questions that people have towards the end, but moved into camera department from post-production. So on set there, and then from there, digital media management with Universal and uh, visual effects. Here I am. Great. Uh, great. Great to have you on board, Elia. And finally, uh, we're going to bring on Richard Sanchez, who is a VFX editor and is also the co-creator of Master of the Workflow. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Richard. Hi, uh, I've been in post-production for 15 years, got my start in reality TV um, back on Final Cut Pro when people used it. And uh, it's uh, been a journey from reality to scripted TV to feature films. Uh, about four years ago, I hopped over from assistant editing to VFX editing. And it's been uh, really exciting exploring that, you know, just in in the, the specialization of it and the, the ubiquity of visual effects in, uh, in how there really are no, there's no such thing as a non-visual effects film anymore. And it's been really exciting kind of being, having my hand on, uh, on the, the smoke and mirrors aspect of the filmmaking process so thanks richard all right so you see our star panel here and we're gonna get start dig right into talking about the strikes so uh i don't know all of the different press that everybody watches but there is a consensus that there were massive uh financial losses in the los angeles economy at some measures say six billion dollars lost during the strikes which is is pretty massive uh, I was telling some people uh, in, in the community that um, that would be the equivalent of having a, a FEMA disaster. Um, and we did not have any systems like that, right? Um, it's not like COVID where we actually, there was federal support. We all had to muscle through this and, and slog through it. Um, we had all kinds of effects like price compression on VFX bids because every competitor was taking work uh, just to, even at a loss, just to get business in. That was better than nothing. We had layoffs and furloughs across the board, MPC had them, DNEG had them, Fuse, Framestore, Method, everybody had them, right? Significant ones. We had them at Crafty Apes. And um, we also even saw closures and bankruptcies. Outpost left Los Angeles, and we saw Lucasfilm bail out of the Singapore um, uh, start uh, for their facilities. MISC and Envis went away in London. Goodbye Kansas went bankrupt, which I don't know if you guys ever dealt with them, but I knew a lot of folks from there. So um, really, really impactful in a very you know, hard way for the industry. So now we're in the recovery. And um, I don't know if anybody feels like it's recovered yet, but it, we, I'm sure we would all agree it hasn't completely recovered. And we're going to be working on that for quite a while. Um, so um, we don't know what the new normal will be. We've seen predictions that um, we're going to be 30 to 40 percent off peak in terms of production. And there will be new cost pressures on budgets uh, due to the guild agreements, which were well deserved. But that means you've got a fixed piece of pie and more money goes upstream. That means post and VFX are going to be more challenged. And to top that all off, we could have a Yahtzee strike um, this summer. So we've got all that. And I'm going to direct my first question to Aaliyah. Uh, you mentioned earlier, <laughs> yeah, sorry for that's a tough lead in here, but you're going to tell, but you're going to tell a great story. So, um, speaking of stories, um, you'd mentioned earlier when we did our prep call that we'll see a return to story driven content. And uh, I'd love to hear more about um, what you were talking about with how you see that shift away from superhero franchises affecting visual effects. Yeah, no, you know, I think, um, I got really into history podcasts through COVID. And one thing I really learned a lot about it is history tends to repeat itself. Uh, we see that displayed everywhere. And I think as you have, you know, long careers in this industry, things that can seem scary initially right off the bat, you actually start to see that that we're just living in a giant trend, right? And I think that, you know, ultimately, um, you'll see in the Oscar shortlist and uh, some things that are coming up in the VES awards that there's some really great films out there that I wouldn't call them, we don't like to call them small visual effects films. It's more like just not as heavy, right? There are heavy visual effects films and that are ones that are using it more as a supportive tool set. And I think that we're seeing a lot of those start to come around. I also think that, you know, along with the story platform of it, um, because I do think that there was probably a trend over the last maybe, what, 
10 years, we could say, where there was the the visual awe of some of these very heavy visual effects driven films. And sometimes when you have big visual awe, you aren't necessarily putting as much time and energy into how the story all comes together. Um, and I think, you know, audiences are interested in story again. I mean, it's interesting when you see I'll mention TV more so than film because I think films just had a bumpy, you know, last couple of years, especially theatrical. But if you look at TV, we'll look at stuff like We Have Reacher. It's such a phenomenon of a show to some degree, but not heavy in visual effects. And it's sort of straight to the point in what it is. And audiences love it. I think it's a really entertaining uh, story. You have things like The Bear. You have things like Yellowstone. I mean, these were... Uh, and they're popular with young audiences, too, which I just think is amazing because it really isn't about the the spectacle of visuals on screen. It's really about the story. And I think that those are also slightly more successful in predicting how you will shoot them. And I think that's sort of more the time frame that we're looking into over this next year and beyond is responsible filmmaking, we will call it. You know, I think from a budgetary perspective, um, where everyone's really looking into how to make things and what is the more predictive way to do that. And, you know, visual effects is a department that can go really crazy uh, all the way up to the end. Yeah, no, that's great. Really, I, I think I, for one, am, am excited about seeing the return to story. I do enjoy great story. I do enjoy huge visual effects, but it has its place. It, it's not appropriate for most movies, I think. It, um, but they always, as Richard was saying earlier, it's there. It's everywhere. It's always there. Um, so I mean, Rich, I so, tried in Guardians of the Galaxy, so they got me. You know what I mean? They got me. They did it. Yes. They, missed they had everything. real they stories. They got those beautiful emotional content, right? And then that's great. You use those moments and you really hit them with a bang. And those artists should be immensely, you know, happy with how that turned out because I think it's incredibly emotional. And then, you know, you, um, you can tell stories that we are a supporting role to that to just sort of help you know that filmmaker get that idea out but it doesn't necessarily need to be the entire thing blue screen that's a, it's a great observation well richard uh when you were talking about how you've been coming out of the strikes and your colleagues you said that many of them have been saying that premiere dates aren't moving what a shocker right so that puts immense pressure in terms of timeline and and effort on um everybody to i hope they're probably burning the midnight oil because everybody wants to get the work done and and not have anybody be disappointed um it's not going to be like the post-covid boom from what we've heard but still stressful so can you tell us a little bit more about how you and your colleagues are dealing with these kind of compressed timelines to meet the the fixed uh, release dates yeah, you know, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head when you, you, you when you said surprise, surprise. I mean, it's, it's really not an altogether surprising thing. It happens pretty frequently, especially on tentpole projects. You have a very hard deadline, and everybody wants to hit that for a variety of reasons, which I feel like was all the more exacerbated in this era of cinematic universe films, where everything builds upon everything else. So these release dates are all the more critical than they've really ever been. But what we are finding coming out of of the strike is, I mean, we've all lost six months of time, and there is a sense of we still want to push forward based on the schedules we have, because one push moves everything down. And as freelancers, especially for younger folks, we tend to be uh, people pleasers by nature. I, I am certainly no exception to that rule. Uh, everybody wants to be a hero and save the day. And I think the really tricky thing is uh, coming to a sense of balance between your need to go above and beyond, but also recognize that we as artists also have a responsibility to inform production uh, in a in a pragmatic sense of, I understand you want to make this deadline, and I'm going to I'm going to do everything in my power to make that deadline, but I need to inform you that there might be compromises that will have to be made. Are you prepared to make those compromises? And, you know, it's kind of one thing of, you know, you you you, you throw up a yellow flag early on because you don't want to get everybody on high alert just yet. So you're you're there's a sense of I'm saying this just to say this. So this is this is how many shots we need to get done. We need 3000 shots done by this date. Now typically that I would expect that would take this much time. I'm sure if you talk to your vendors they will also try to please you as much as possible, but let's be pragmatic and as changes come cuz change is the name of the game. 
you know, it, it becomes important that we are also flagging. This is now an orange flag. This is a red flag. You know, I'm just saying this to say it. And if you tell me that we're pushing forward, we'll push forward, but at least we've said it. Because I do think there's both from the standpoint of the responsibility to the production, because it's our job, that's our expertise. But also, I think it's important that we take stock of our own mental health. And I was hoping that COVID would be this inflection point not just for our industry, but all industries. I think, you know, certainly the American work, work culture, but I mean, it's there's a worldwide work culture of you work through being sick, you work through being overworked, and, you know, there's a time to go, hey, um, you're, this is becoming a bit much. And sometimes if your words aren't being heard in terms of your own individual health, uh, you can shift that in terms of, well, my health is suffering, but also, the product will suffer too if we're all being worked to death. So I think it 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 introduces the the need for us to inform the powers that be how this will affect us personally and how it'll affect the product. That's a great way to put it, Richard. I saw a lot of here here's in the chat window, and I would say that um, you know really it's as you pointed out, it's a responsibility to talk about physics, meaning not achievable at all, but also human impact. Um, I think those are, are both critical. Well, so now when we look at um, some of the uh, visible effects of what we're experiencing right now in the strikes, we have even more financial pressure on the industry. And it's not like it's new, <clears throat> but and like I'll say even before the strikes, we were seeing signals from studios and streamers that they were pulling back on production. We, we already said that that's possibly going to be even 30 to 40 percent off peak, which is a material challenge for the industry. It's also unclear how quickly our rates will recover from the low levels we were talking about during the strikes or whether they will even fully recover. People will probably still be um, undercutting uh, to win jobs for a while because we, we don't know when this new normal is going to settle out. Um, we continue to have outsourcing pressure to other countries with low cost regions like India and China and elsewhere that are competing for this work. Um, we also continue to have VFX studios who want to satisfy filmmakers and they'll deal with no cost revisions, right? Over and over and over again. And that hit, that's hit on margins and hitting profitability. Um, we've got the industry driving to further consolidation, which saddles companies with debt, makes revenue and profitability even more of an urgent matter to cover interest pay payments. And then on the artist side, when you were talking about this, Richard, it's not just an issue of burnout from long hours on impossible schedules, but it's also when you have companies chasing rebates, it's, you know, each region decides they want to attract business there. Historically, artists have followed that to a, a large extent, and it's hard to have that a kind of a stable personal life. Um, we've also seen, <clears throat> to compound uh, the issue, the, the recent news, well, I shouldn't say it's recent news, but more uh, publicized news of directors saying there was no CGI in the movie. So it's sort of it, inadvertently they're devaluing the hard work that artists are putting into this. So it just continues this misperception of the importance of visual effects. Um, one thing we're not going to go into detail in this um, session is <clears throat> about VFX unionization. It's obviously a hotter topic because the strikes didn't work last year for, for the WGA and SAG and VFX. Um, we, people might have said 10 years ago that um, this was never going to really be a possibility, but we see that Marvel and Disney um, had unionization in the studio side. Uh, DNEG in Canada unionized, but that's really a topic for its own forum. So um, if there are questions that we see in the chat or the Q&A window at the end, we'll do our best to address them. But we have all of this. Um, it really puts a, an increased amount of pressure on our industry. So I'm going to go back again to Aaliyah, and I'm going to ask from a studio perspective, how do you view the current VFX vendor community's state of affairs? Um, you know, we talk to vendors a lot and daily and many of them all around the world. And unfortunately, you know, n not not from a negative standpoint, but I do think that there's still some hardships that the vendors are going to feel. I think that, you know, when we talk about the strikes and we say six months, that's mostly for crew who are particularly working on set for something. But, um, you know, vendors are still going to have to wait to see that work come through for probably another anywhere from three to six more months, depending on the shoot. You know, we'll take a, a shoot we have, for example, and the problem with the 
the strikes and the aftermath of that was there was a domino effect, right? So you have to now juggle actors' availabilities, and some actors needed to finish up projects that didn't finish. So how does that now impact your current project? And weather is actually a huge component of the shooting schedules that are out there right now. Um, and so we have a show that's going to shoot and then go on break for a little while while the, the storms um, pass because we need exteriors and we'll pick back up in spring. Well, what does that mean for the vendors that are working on that show, right? I mean, that's, it is it is a hardship and it's not, I think visual effects, like any post-production uh, service, I think post tends to get hit the hardest. Anyone who lived through the writer strikes of, I believe, 2007 was that 2007 2008 we saw a very similar occurrence there where post-production gets hit the hardest we are a part of that process um, because we're you know the last in line to get that stuff fed down the pipeline so I would say that it's tricky for all the vendors that are out there it sounds and they're juggling it sounds like everyone is juggling you know, how to keep artists on for as long as possible, uh, the different varieties of, of ways to do that. Um, in some cases, we're trying to award a certain amount up front, you know, to just kind of keep that going. And then as we get into the bulk of the work towards the end of the year, that at least keeps keeps the um, the food chain coming down, right? So I think there's a variety of ways we're all trying to deal with it, but it is going to be a hardship, I think, still for another few months from a vendor perspective. You know, I appreciate that you said that, Aaliyah. I, I, I was, uh, when I was still at Crafty Apes, um, our uh, clients were coming to us and saying, how do we support you? We need you. Um, so it's good to see that you're taking, I appreciate that you're taking measures to help get some kind of forward commitment that can keep people going because it is, it's a very challenging situation. Absolutely. I mean, we want all of these vendors to be successful. Like I, I would, I, I speak for myself and from my colleagues. It's like, we want everyone to be successful. We want the artistry and the artists and the whole, the whole ecosystem of this to ultimately be very successful. And there are ways to try and help it. And I think we're all trying to dive in together. I think that, you know, over the years, one of the best parts about this is that you develop relationships and, you know, you, you, uh, there are, People on the vendor side, I care immensely about. People on the production side, I care immensely about, you know, and it's, uh, I think that we're all trying to find the right ways to make that successful with what we have on our plate right now. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to go to Marcus on the supervisor side. Um, you shared some predictions uh, when we were talking earlier about how you think the industry will change post-strike. And I, I'd like you to uh, tell us a little more about what you see ahead and why you think that. Well, AI is touching everything. Um, I, think, I think Aaliyah pointed out the other day that it's even on our phones, right? It's just everywhere. It's going to touch everything without us even realizing it. And I think we haven't quite realized how it's going to impact us um, in the future because um, it's already impacting us now. You, you see, you know, directors coming in saying, oh, I did this thing on my phone. Can you copy that? And, and lots of things. So you definitely see a lot of more power on that side, on the director side and that unit. As that's going to become bigger and bigger and and drive more creative and be more specific, which actually should help us because there should be more drawings, you know, unless I'll make it like that. I'll know it when I see it, you know, which has always been the bane of our existence to try and capture something that actually isn't even possible, you know, and you go around in circles and then do the first thing you did, you know, it happens so many times. Uh, so uh, and that probably is, it turns into a bigger conversation about how AI will impact everything. I, I I can't help but be an optimist. I just just imagine that bounce back that we got post COVID, and then it will be again. But um, I just That's keep my fingers you crossed. Need your optimism, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you for being optimistic. Uh, as yeah. Wendy was saying yeah, to us yeah, earlier, like we, let's go. Out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I, I've made a lot of effort to try and you know help small companies kind of band themselves together and and be there because I think it's easier and easier to to kind of communicate with those smaller companies and bring them in. Because a lot of people were forced to start a little company, a little three-person unit located across the globe. So the more we can do to help those teams, I think the better. And I think they're going to do quite well because their overhead's lower and they're more nimble. And, and they'll be using these AI tools quicker than any of the big studios. Right? The big studios are having trouble with um, really implementing a lot of this AI. 
Well, you know, I, I, I think it's a great segue. Thank you for, for uh, getting into that area. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about what I've um, seen uh, as not being deep in the, as a practitioner, unlike Marcus. Um, you know, as we all know, AI became the hot topic. ChatGPT all of a sudden made us all think, oh, AI just happened. And everybody else said, like, no, actually, AI has been happening for decades. Um, but it was not really accessible on a consumer level, and it was hard to really grasp or use as a regular user. So that's part of what we've seen change, right? Um, and it was a surprise that that became the AI became this the the big bugaboo of the WGA and SAG negotiations because I I don't think they were thinking necessarily that was going to be the the sticking point um, when they started thinking about the strikes. Um, some of the promise we've seen is people say that it'll remove mundane, repetitive tasks and uh, people can have sort of a partner in what they do, whatever their day to day tasks are. Others see impending doom from job loss as AI does more of what humans do. Um, I know that uh, LA, uh, the post production group had a great presentation from Adobe last month on how they've incorporated AI into the product suite. And we've all seen demos of different tools like Mid Journey that we say, oh my God, look what you can create there uh, for rapid visualization or Wonder Studio does the integration of uh, 3D CG models into your live action uh, picture or, or scene, and then Runway does roto and object removal. So there are tons of tools. They, they change every week. There's new tools. Literally, um, if you look at uh, Futurepedia, it, it, I think it has at least <clears throat> uh, 100 or more new tools every week. So Marcus, you've been focusing the most of us all in um, the understanding what the AI can do and what the limitations are. So in your experiments, you mentioned earlier to us um, on the, in the prep call, the challenges with production deployment. So can you tell us more about what those challenges have been and um, um, so what, what kind of ideas you have on how we will overcome some of those challenges? I mean, it's such a different beast, right? When you're trying to deploy machine learning or that type of team into it, it even the version control is so much more complicated because you have to version all the, the data lakes and all the iterations and keep track of the feedback. It's just a, a little bit strange for us to get our heads used to or used to that kind of workflow. And, and then, because in a lot of ways, it will just go wrong by itself. It will just kind of drift off into a bad place. And you, we're finding that you really have to build individual models for everything. We thought, oh, I remember pitching to Zoic back I think, eight years ago. Oh, yeah, we can do auto-roto. Let's start like talking to Indian vendors and like trying to gather, gather their data. And we can just do this. But the fact is that like, you actually really need to train a model per sequence, per, per actor right now. Like, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it doesn't quite work. I, I, I know there's some really good... Um, kind of initiatives to do this uh, kind of purple green screen thing. Um, and, and that's very commendable. And I think it will work. It's just we're way away from really deploying all that stuff right now, or the magenta green screen, sorry, which is a weird phrase. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting times, really. I, it, too much to talk about. Well, that's great. I, I know you're going to continue really focusing on where benefits can be achieved today um, with some of the tools you've been focused on and developing. Um, but Aliyah, uh, you mentioned some, uh, some in some ways, humorous experiments with uh, some of the AI tools like Mid Journey, um, but also some successes. So um, tell us a little bit about the shortcomings you found and, and whether you think that's indicative of where AI is today on the creative side. Yeah. Um you know, first, I'll just say that I think, you know, our industry predominantly has been about innovation, right? I mean, if you look, it's just sort of the history of film and post-production very specifically, right? I mean, you know, working at a post facility at the very early stages of my career, it was, we were buying new equipment, new things all the time. I remember when the base light first came into play and an HDSR deck, Jesus Christ, I'm dating myself. But, you know, I think that, that, there's, there's a fear factor that is involved in this conversation. And I think that's, you know, legitimate and understandable for sure. And I think that there's a world where we're looking at these things as, as tools, um, because I think that's just part of our business. Our business naturally evolves and, and visual effects quite quickly. Right. Um, so playing around with it, I always try to play with stuff on my own just because I think that it helps inform you as to how general people will use it. And, and you know, even someone like a director who's not going to understand all the things that you can type in. Right. And I think that's a good POV to have. And uh, 
I find it does have a lot of struggle. And, and I actually knew a supervisor who tried to put together something just to use it as an exercise. And he must have gone through 600 plus iterations to try and just get someone sitting on a vehicle. You know what I mean? It was just, it was, it, it had a lot of trouble with expression and getting, th- you know, the two characters to look at each other. It weirdly had a lot of complication with hands. Um, it had complications with framing. I think that, you know, what it shows you is maybe there's a world where this helps as a starting point to just say, hey, I have an idea and I just need to put it there. And then you want to involve artists to kind of help that story point, but maybe you're you're starting already with something. I, I tend to, and I guess, you know, like Marcus, maybe I'm optimistic about this, but I do feel informed because I study a lot of this stuff on my own time. Um, that I think that ultimately things start to round themselves back out as tools. We can reference LEDs as, you know, the the hip thing of a few years ago. And I think that it is now starting to round itself out as yet another tool in our toolbox that we will use. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's also important for people to be open-minded to educate themselves and and teach themselves new new, new skill sets along with those tools, right? Yeah, talking yeah. of yeah, educating, oh, ahead, right? I, I, I think one of the big things that's coming out of this is not really as much image generation, even though Photoshop and Adobe have done an amazing job, which you spoke about already. But what I found is the most impactful is using GPTs basically as a training aid. Um, I've seen a few Nuke GPTs, um, so the compositing software, and I, I could just imagine that in the hands of anyone in the in the developing world, you know, in a village somewhere, they, they've got Nuke and they've got Nuke GPT, which is a an amazing instructor. Um, yeah, it, it's the the implications for education are immense. Um, it's, it's certainly done a lot for my education. And I mean, you know, we already have parts of it in there that are helping our pipeline, generically speaking, right? There are components of it that are helping in roto, in denoise, in some aspects of face replacement where maybe an artist isn't starting from scratch. You're helping them get a percentage of the way there, sometimes with character animation, where it's just helping artists get a percentage of the way there so that, you know, you're not necessarily turning your wheels on, you know, this large chunk of time that isn't ultimately getting you to the really creative meat and potatoes of what you're doing. And I think that there's a world where that will be the more beneficial part of it versus taking out the human element of it. Because I think one thing I have found in in dealing with it is it does lack something that human beings give it, a soul, you'll call it, a little bit that, you know, is a big part of our business, a huge part of our business. Yeah, so there, we've seen that there's uh, success with the, tr- the ideas of training. There is facilitation going on where there are some accelerations of some of the more mundane kind of tasks. And also um, the visualization and communication that both Marcus and Aliyah were talking about. Now, Richard has uh, put, he put, as we were saying earlier, he put together with a, a partner a, a course that um, I believe is used in 40 countries. Is that right, Richard? The master of the workflow, the master that, of the workflow. That's correct. And so clearly you had to think through like, what are the, what are the mechanisms for teaching people? Now, when we look at AI, it's great that Ilya is experimenting with it. Marcus is exploring it, but you can't, I, 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 what I observed was it's really impossible for anyone on a day-to-day basis along with their job to stay current and to understand what the baseline is and how to keep on learning. So I, I challenge Richard to think about this and say, what, what would you do advised AI newcomers having thought through how to train people on, on a craft um, like editorial? Well, you know, you, you you hit the nail on the head when you when you mentioned staying current. And, you know, to preface this answer, I say that I am uh, philosophically opposed to the notion of the right way of doing things. I don't train people on the right way of doing things because there is no right way of doing things. I'll show people how I do it, and I'm also fundamentally opposed to people simply replicating what I show them because that doesn't benefit anybody. What's imperative is that people understand what they need, how to get there, and I I kind of teach the class from a in an algebraic perspective, you know, like if C is the finished product and A are the dailies, how do we get to B to equal C? And, you know, 
it's one of those things where um, adaptability is the name of the game. So what you knew five years ago was great and worked five years ago. What you knew two years ago was different from that. It works now. And how that relates to what we're dealing with now with AI is there's a lot of great things that are coming out. And very much like Aliyah said, I think there's a ton of value in playing with these tools. And I think it's imperative that people play with these tools when the stakes are low, when the pressure is off, you know, when you when you have the opportunity to go, here's an AI tool. Like, for example, the other day I was playing with a tool that you could upload a song and it would spit out stems. And that's a great tool, for example, when you're looking for a score or if you want to, say, get a needle drop, because nowadays most artists will record songs without lyrics for this purpose. But prior to the 90s, that wasn't really the case. And there's something cool about, hey, this is something that wasn't really feasible prior. We can play with this. But the the importance is outside of the context of your job when the pressure's on, you can kind of see what you can come with come up with in the moment so that when the moment arises and someone says, Hey Richard, can you get me this thing? And you go, as a matter of fact, I think I can. And 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 what I think I can do today might become the norm tomorrow and everything else is going to change with that. So I think that is that is the the imperative with AI. That's, you know, I think that's so important. Uh, I, I do think because of pressures, especially in the past year that people are going through where people where studios would come and say, you need to be using AI to solve this shot problem. And you're like, OK, let's go figure this out like right now. And while we're under the gun, uh, we're going to do this. And what I saw happen was you would try with the AI tools and fail. And then you go and spend way more money on the artists to fix the to, to, to do the issue and lose money. You'd, you'd lose money on it. So, yeah, it's very important to figure it out as a as a as a line of um, research and attempts without being on the firing line where you've got to get a shot out, obviously. All right. I'm going to move on to the last topic, which is career mobility. So through the last year of layoffs and uncertainty for everyone, many veteran VFX professionals talked about changing industries and taking their skills to an adjacent realm like gaming or even corporate work or government work. And then younger artists have expressed how hard it is to find mentors in the business when we're still heavily work from home and we've all become dispersed. So it begs the question, what does today's career arc look like for people in the VFX space, whether you're just getting started or whether you're deep into your career. So I'm going to ask each of you briefly uh, how you start in the entertainment business and uh, the key steps that got you to where you are, um, just as a to help people understand that what mobility it has been in the past. And maybe if you have a little tip for our younger viewers, um, that would be great too. So I'm going to start off with Richard. You know, I got my start in the most cliche way possible. I was working for a company uh, shooting on mini DV at the corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Cherokee, and a friend from high school turns the corner, and I say, hey, good to see you. What are you up to? I'm an assistant editor in reality. And a week later, you know, I called someone who needed someone. It doesn't get more cliche than that. But that said, um, I have found as far as integrating oneself into the community, especially when we don't have connections, there is a lot of value in Facebook groups. And the general ethos is just generosity is always valuable. You know something and someone needs help. You know, a friend in need is a friend indeed. And I have found that so many people were so helpful to me in the early days, even before Facebook uh, on the Creative Cal forums. I mean, that was basically my film school. And so I have always taken a strong sense of so many people have helped, you know, have, have helped build my career and it's my responsibility to pay that back. And so... As far as starting, I think that is that has always been like my general um, ethos, you know, and continuing to to uh, prop people up with that. And kind of to your point, too, about mentors, it's a difficult thing because timelines are tighter than ever nowadays. And I think everybody likes the idea of being a mentor, but the commitment is incredibly hard, especially when, you know, our shooting ratios are through the roof and we got to hit those deadlines. So I think it just really requires a real deliberate. Uh, attempt to, uh, you know, you got to cut. 
Let's look at it. Let's talk about it, you know, and there's no real easy way to do that because everyone is going to have different time commitment commitments and different family commitments. But I think for up and you know, young comers, you know, just taking time to go, hey, I'd love to show you something if you can. And and if, if you're shot down, you're shot down. And that's unfortunate. But being persistent, but also but the, the, if there's nothing else I would leave people with is be kind, ask questions, do good work. I love that advice. I think I, I, everybody I've ever given advice to, I say, network like hell and do stuff outside of work because that's how you're going to figure out a lot of the stuff that you're going to be able to bring value to, like you said, where you say, I actually do know how to do that. Um, all right, we're going to move on to Marcus. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah I tell us about your that. journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, those three guides, they were perfect. I, I can't really add anything to that. Be really kind. I, I came from England, so my story is a little bit different, a bit scrappier, really. I turned up in LA with a backpack on, knocked on every door. The last door let me in and pure luck. Right? There'd be a huge fork in the road there. I could have been back in England, but now I'm here. Um, I did many years in LA, and but I actually did have to follow the tax credits. So I went to Singapore, I did Australia, uh, and, I, and now I'm a Canadian citizen. So I've been all over. So I, I basically, to, to, it seems right now, and the reality is, Get in, you have to be those three things. You have to especially be kind. There's no one wants someone like that in the middle of the night to work with. And it, you, the reality is you have to move for the work. It's, it's sad but true, which is kind of a young person's game, really, because it's such a nascent industry. Us old folks now, which is so surreal to say that because it feels like yesterday I was the, the intern, but um, what do we do now? We have families and kids. Can I follow these rebates again? You know, and, so you're either kind of classically getting into the business or getting out, right? So, um, yeah, so I'm doing extra stuff to, to try and, I guess, get out. Uh, I'm not so sure, just to try and keep everything moving forwards, right? Well, thank you to the person who was the last door that you knocked on for getting you out. All right, Aliyah, I'm very curious about your story. Uh, probably a little bit similar to Marcus in that sense that, uh, I also just moved here when I was like, God, 19, I think, and happened to randomly call a post-production facility to be a receptionist. Um, I tell people when, you know, cause as you move up in your career, advice is probably one of the things you get asked about the most. How do I get into the career? How do I maintain in the career? How do I move up? Um, and I would say that, that for me, what I usually try to tell people, so I, so I moved from being a receptionist, spending time on my off hours to learn as much as I could, and then eventually moving into DI producing. When I was on DI, I was talking to a wonderful DP, uh, you may know, his name is Chivo, who is also Emmanuel Lebeski. And we were working on a small film with Terrence Malick called Tree of Life. And I was absolutely in love with this film and the whole process of it. And I remember telling him, I'd really like to visit you on set one day. And one day he just called me and said, hey, would you like to come out to Bartlesville, Oklahoma for a week? And we had to set up a small screening room for a Tree of Life, but they happened to be shooting the next film. So I did that, absolutely fell in love. Happened to also be working in DI with another wonderful DP named John Toll, who was finishing up, I know, right? Absolute insanity. Uh, who was finishing up some projects. And I happened to also say to him, I'd really like to at some point figure out in my career how to take post and on set and try to merge them together. And I think sometimes when you talk about those types of things, people are like, oh, she's interested in this opportunity, he or she. Um, maybe I will, you know, I always tell people speak up about the things that you want to talk about because you never know where an opportunity is. And he called me and said, I've got a role as a PA in my camera department, if you're interested. And honestly, I, I tell people one of the biggest pieces of advice is adaptation. I think that that is part of our industry from a technological standpoint, but it's also from a human standpoint. I, you know, left a career uh, that I had already established for many years and started over as a PA. And I've actually done that twice in my life, weirdly enough, because it was a whole other opportunity to get into visual effects. And I often tell people, you want to study stuff. You want to invest on your own time. I mean, when you invest on your own time, it's investing in yourself, you know, making yourself 
you know, as you learn more and get better at things, that's ultimately an investment in yourself. You don't have to look at it as investing for somebody else. That's for yourself. Um, and, you know, try to connect with really good people. I think good people are important in this industry. And I've always told any of like my up and comers that I work with, PAs, coordinators, it, it's like, this may not be the end result opportunity of what you're looking for, but if you put in the work, we will teach you anything you want to know. We will make sure you are set up for whatever you can be in the next stages. Um, and I think it's good to also align yourself with people who want to do that too, you know? Uh, but adaptation, I think, is a big one. It's it's scary out there. I totally understand. Um, I've worked for places that have gone under. And, um, you know, it's important to not try and get so consumed by that and and see where the opportunities are because they're always they're always there. They may be hidden a little bit, but they're always there. Well, I think uh, you guys have rounded out what um, th there was going to be a question I was going to ask everybody about like, what is your one piece of advice for the people on this call? But I think we've heard abundant advice about networking and investing in yourself. I saw some people saying be humble, be nice, like what Richard said. And I think that really, um, I think that sums up what people need to do. And I do think it's also um, finding that community, like I, I think you were all saying, uh, because it is a hard time and it is going to be confusing time, I think this year in particular, um, because it's not going to be a straight path through um, what we were, what I've been calling the recovery um, for 2024. But in the end, content is going to continue to be made. VFX is still going to be essential, but it is going to require um, adaptation and learning new skills and being willing to uh, be mobile and, and flexible. Uh, that's what I guess I would say. So I think we've got some good time for some Q&A, Wendy. Um, so let's hear some of the questions. Why don't you tee up the first one? Uh, before we do that, could we get a quick little um, insight into your career path, Craig, to see how you got? Sure, sure. So I was a nerd and um, I studied electrical engineering. Uh, I was studying robotics, actually. And I started in my career in the defense industry at the tail end of the Ronald Reagan era. So I am definitely way older than everybody here. Um, but I um, started a company with some guys from college and we were uh, partners with Oracle Corporation who uh, was, and we were doing office automation, very un unsexy today, but it was sexy then. And Oracle got into media and entertainment. And so I got on a, an interactive television project in 1993. And that was how I got my start. I kept on doing startups and freelancing through uh, robotics. I, I was on the Lego Mindstorms launch team for robotics, their first robotic toy. And I was at Universal Music Group when they were competing with Napster so successfully. And, um, and then eventually got into um, post, but more on the technical side, and eventually got more into operations. Um, and then um, Paramount Pictures, when I heard about the opportunity there, I was like, ooh, studios, that sounds good. I'll go over there. I know that's like a while ago because uh, now it's a little harder in some of the studios. But that's, I kept on doing that, trying to move more upstream towards creative. And I kept on feeling like I've got to get closer to the creative. And so my ultimate at, at Amazon Studios was when I was actually running the post-production operations team worldwide for unscripted and scripted and and and. and, and film, uh, which was so exciting, like actually re really reading scripts, that, that blew me away that I was doing that and dealing with real directors. Um, and then finally, Crafty Apes, uh, it was uh, an opportunity that I heard about, and it was just uh, unfortunately some bad timing in terms of what last year was. Um, so it made sense for me to move on. But that's, that's my uh, long-winded way of saying. Uh, but I will say, I networked like crazy when I got to LA. I went to Venice Interactive Community Meetings. I don't know if you guys remember those. And Digital Hollywood. And there was another one called Streaming Media West and a bunch of other stuff like that that was back in the uh, mid-90s. And um, I always um, uh, tried to help out people when I could and um, tried my best to treat people with respect even when it was not coming back from them. And, um, you know, you never know. You never know who you're going to report to someday, and they never know who that they're, whether they're going to report to you. Uh, that's not a good motivation for being a good person, but it's just good to point out. That's it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I'm going to hop on. We have time for a couple questions. Um, let me see. 
Let's just start right at the top real quick. Uh, what happens when you give, this is an anonymous person. What happens when you give your concerns about finishing tasks on time and you risk having them go to someone else when you raise those red flags? Does that make sense? Yeah. You want to take that, Marcus, yeah, I, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Basically, don't worry about it. You just got one thing you need to learn is to have courage in this business, especially on the production, I mean, sorry, on the kind of vendor side, you're one of the, the thousands of people that are working on that show. Just, you just got to have courage and build that courage to show early and be, be open and just don't worry. Just let it wash off your back. Just don't worry about it because otherwise you're going to be worrying about a million other things. It's just life's too complicated as it is. You, you just got to learn to have that kind of don't give an F attitude, right? And just be, be straight. Be conscientious and don't worry. Finding your voice is a lifelong process, isn't it? Man, yeah, yeah. And don't feel that supervisors don't have those same feelings like this. There's some moments, right? So, it, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another one. Uh, this one's anonymous as well. Uh, I would love to know what advice you would give to people specifically feeling anxiety because of everything that is happening. We all want the ecosystem to be successful, but a lot of people are not going to make it through this without help. Um, that, and this person says, my anxiety is, it is real. So is there anything, for, uh, let me just do a quick plug. Next month, we are going to be talking about mental health and well-being at our next LAPPG meeting. But I would love to hear from you guys if you have anything that you could share about how to handle when this gets really tough. Richard, I think you were, Richard was uh, talking a little bit about this earlier. I'd love to hear Richard's further thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I think of with this, and it's hard for all of us, uh, is, you know, reaching out to the resources that we have, uh, which is a big one is the Entertainment Community Fund. Uh, a lot of people contributed to this during the strike. It's there. Uh, a lot of these systems are not the easiest things in the world to get uh, to or the timeliest, but they are resources that are there and we should really reach out to them. And also, I think there's something to be said uh, as far as, you know, I've been trying to reach out to my own friends in need is we can all take a little bit of personal responsibility with ourselves and with our friends and just like and just reaching in and I found in general things that have meant the world for me are the people who are just kind of reaching out and saying hey do you just want to get a cup of coffee let's just 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 stop and sit with each other for a moment and be human for a while because we're all terrified and I think the most terrifying thing going on right now too is a lot of us thought that uh, January would mean there would be an unkinking of the hose and there would be work for everyone and thus far we're finding that not to necessarily be the case. There's a world of anxiety for the potential for an upcoming IOTC strike and or uh, a Teamster strike and the one thing that I'm, uh, I've been using personally to ground myself self is in is there's no reason to get overly caught up in those notions because there are no proposals so there is no reason to think there will be a strike thus far so we shouldn't think that we'll think that we're going to go through this and it's going to be okay and and even if there is one it's beyond our control so giving ourselves anxiety over it is really not going to help us and i know that's so much easier said than done and i know that i'm somewhat saying something while on the inside going uh i don't know that i'm always the best at practicing what i'm preaching as i'm saying that but um but i think trying to be mindful of that is the best thing we can do is take care of ourselves reach out to your friends and try to reach out to the resources we have because we do have them very thoughtful answer, Richard. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we, we have one more um, time for one more. As a VFX supervisor, I've been fortunate to work on a lot of cool projects, although they are on the smaller scale. I want to learn more and possibly do bigger projects. Where can I learn more about VFX supervising and how do I make myself attractive to bigger projects? I would love to hear what you guys advise or have to say. That is very hard. Actually, uh, VFX supervision itself is more just like a, a lightning strike that seems to land on, on you. And um, moving up through different strata of that role is very, very difficult. Um, I would say join my LinkedIn group, but I wouldn't believe that really would be that helpful. Um, 
That's a tough one. Uh, what is you your have to LinkedIn group? group so on, we know. Ahead. Yeah, could you share that? Oh, the LinkedIn group. Is that what you said? Yeah, I can yeah. put it in the chat or something. Oh, or that would be great. Follow up email with you. Um, but yeah, it's a VFX supervisors group, and we're very snobby. There's only VFX supervisors in it. But um, uh, yeah, do external projects as much as you can. But it's a tough one. You, you really just keep um, just keep interviewing. And eventually someone's going to need that position at that right time and they're willing to give you a break to jump up one strata. You just got to it's keep funny it. too because a, a friend of mine was a, was a camera guy and he wanted to get into Steadicam and he bought all the equipment and then started doing student films just to get stuff under his belt. And I say this because, um, you know, from our perspective as a supervisor, right, as we hire people and, and we set up shows, there's a part of it that a lot of people don't realize and it's a casting component of it. You know, it's not just how good you are technically or what you have on your resume, but it's also how you get along with a director or the creatives or the producer. And then if you're maybe an in-house supervisor, um, what is your relationship with the external supervisors that are out there? It is, there is a bit of um, some multi-layers to that, but it isn't, you know, I always try to tell people, it's not just how smart you are and, and how technically savvy you may be. Um, it's, it's showing your career creative eye. So even if you aren't working on something as a supervisor, if there are projects you can do on your own, sometimes those go a far way as well to say, you know, here's something small I did internally. I know some vendors put together uh, internal projects to help with that, but there is a casting component to that where, um, you know, you have to, you have to mesh, you know, with the creative team and, 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 be on the same wavelength of, of those type of things. And, and part of that is just, you know, getting out there and, and talking to people and kind of understanding that interview process and asking questions of supervisors that are working uh, in that role, I think is a, is a good component of it. What are things directors like? How does that process go? Because that's usually your first step to even getting in the door uh, with a lot of those. And it can be make or break. I've seen people with amazing resumes that have not landed the interview. Um, so there's that component to be aware of. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. What a wonderful discussion we have. I, I think that maybe uh, six months from now, a year from now, we need to come back again and see where we're all at. Um, I really appreciate your time, everyone, and your expertise. Thank you. And thank you, everybody at home. I know there's like so much, so many more questions. We just don't have the time right now. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook and on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Use the hashtag LAPPG and uh, you follow us and we'll do our best to follow you. And a huge thank you to all of our partners. At the Platinum level, we have AJ Video Systems. At the Gold level, Adobe Blackmagic Design, OWC, Zeiss, Frame.io. And at the Silver level, Isotope uh, by Native Instruments, SGO. Edit Share and Avid. And we have a lot of other amazing groups and companies that support us. Um, we have supporting partners, media partners, as well as community partners. So a big thank you to all of them as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good have a good night. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.